Hey mamas, I'm Carrie with Reset Brain and Body. Welcome to Mental Health Mondays. Hey mamas, uh, I'm Carrie with Reset. Welcome to Mental Health Mondays here at Detroit Moms. So for those of you that have been following on the last few months, we are an integrative mental health care practice located in Plymouth, Michigan, but also operating virtually throughout the state. I am the owner, founder, and clinical director at Reset, and I am so excited to be here and share with you now through the end of the year more of my story and my perspective on some really hot mental health topics. And so today we are talking about pregnancy and infancy loss, and it is Pregnancy and Infancy Loss Awareness Month, the month of October, and it's something that I'm really passionate about. So. A little bit about my story. I have two boys at home. I have Cole, who is three, and Ellis, who is just about six months. And I had a really traumatic birth experience with my older son, Cole. Um, he ended up being IUGR, so he was intrauterine growth restriction. So he was born at four and a half pounds. And I was induced at 37 weeks with sudden onset preeclampsia and that itself was okay fine we can we can handle it those of you that have had preeclampsia or had to um deal with magnesium know what i'm talking about when we talk about how awful that bed rest experience can be but what was the most traumatic experience for me with him was that 24 hours after i delivered the midwife came in to check in on me, and again, I'm on magnesium. I'm kind of all over the place mentally, new mom. And she said, I'm really glad that we identified the preeclampsia because, you know, if we hadn't, he may not have been here. And in that moment, my naivete had benefited me up until that moment in that I was grateful that I didn't really know much about complications of childbirth. Um, but in that moment, I was like, holy cow, you're telling me that he could have been a stillborn. And I hung on to that statement for many, many months postpartum. I was completely triggered by that statement and experienced a lot of anxiety and postpartum depression following the birth of him because of the what if. What could I have done differently? How did I make this happen? What's wrong with me, my lifestyle, my health, my history that created the circumstances that could have resulted in a stillbirth? And I was so self-critical and I really just went down a spiral of blame and loneliness and isolation. There's someone saying same. So I'm, I have a feeling that a lot of you might resonate with this. And, you know, I postpartum depression, perinatal mood disorders, postpartum anxiety, it is really near and dear to my heart because what I have found in my experience is that we just don't talk about this enough. We don't validate each other's experiences and the healthcare community doesn't really validate it as often as probably we need. We all know that we don't get enough check-ins on our own mental health. I joke that my second pregnancy, I had my blood pressure checked so often, but never by mental health. <laughs> no one was like, oh, let's put on a little contraption on your arm to see how your anxiety and depression is but you'll check in my blood pressure because that was a complication in my first pregnancy. Well, what about the complication of postpartum depression in my first pregnancy? Who's checking in on that when I'm going to the doctor, my OB every two weeks? Um, so again, we know, we know this though. We know that it's super um, underdiagnosed. It's not talked about. I had a friend who lost her life to postpartum depression. She committed suicide um, and it was devastating just to think about how lonely of a journey that she had in that she wasn't able to get help and she went down a spiral that really wasn't recognized 
So in my second pregnancy with my son, Ellis, I noticed myself having a really heightened sense of anxiety. Um, I bought a Doppler very early on in the pregnancy so I could check his heartbeat the entire time because it, I was so anxious about having a complication. Um, I was having nightmares and flashbacks about having a stillbirth. Um, I had a really hard time resonating with the pregnancy in the beginning because I was so terrified. Um, at 16 weeks, I had a complete meltdown panic attack in my shower because I felt like, okay, maybe I've, maybe we're in the clear, maybe we're in the clear now, 16 weeks. And I finally allowed myself to start to process the pregnancy and really connect to the baby in my belly. Um, I also announced my pregnancy with him really early, probably around five weeks. And I did that on purpose because I, and I feel this with miscarriage, I feel this with pregnancy loss, is that the wives' tale and how we've been told to talk about it when we were growing up or you know, maybe a decade ago or maybe even not, not that long ago was don't talk about it. Because if you have a miscarriage, you don't want anyone to know. You know, it's too soon to tell people. I find that to be so infuriating. <laughs> I get really passionate about this because tell people, tell people you're pregnant, celebrate it, say it at five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, because if something does happen and if you do lose that pregnancy, don't you want that many more people around you to support you and help you? And okay, it's you didn't do anything wrong. And I think that's, again, such of the stigma is that we blame ourselves that, oh, I didn't eat well enough. I was too stressed out. Oh, it's because of diabetes or I'm overweight or whatever it is, we blame ourselves, which then makes it that much more shameful to tell our story. So you guys can tell I'm super passionate about this subject. I think that there is so much work that we can be done that can be done on reducing the stigma around infertility, around pregnancy loss, around infant loss, about the postpartum experience um, with depression and anxiety and perinatal mood disorders in general, that you can experience depression and anxiety while you're pregnant. And that is something that can be treated and you can get on medication for. There are safe medications. And I always talk to my mamas about options for medication, even though we are more of a holistic practice. I like to work in partnership with our healthcare providers to provide that support. So anyways, I think it's important that we talk about our pregnancy and all stages of the pregnancy. So again, we have those people to help support us. And I also am really passionate about making sure that our healthcare providers are trauma informed because like in my experience with my midwife telling me that I could have had a stillbirth, she just maybe lacked sensitivity, maybe lacked some self-awareness. And it was important now for me in the mental health field to be able to talk to healthcare providers about how do we make sure that we're trauma informed, that we're not triggering moms or soon to be moms in this experience. But what do we do? What do we do to heal from miscarriage, pregnancy loss, infant loss? So I've touched on this a little bit already, but one of the most important things that we can do is to combat loneliness. We know that loneliness is a precursor for so many mental health conditions related to anxiety, depression, self-esteem issues. And when we are coping with infertility or pregnancy loss, the loneliness factor is exponential because we feel so much shame about talking about it, about sharing our story. And so the first thing that we have to do, and Detroit Moms is a beautiful platform for this, is talk about it. Share with people that you're struggling. Share that you need a little bit of help. Go talk to a therapist or Find a trusted friend and it doesn't have to be and it maybe shouldn't be your partner because sometimes it's really helpful having validation of someone else that doesn't know you so well being able to say yeah me too I experienced that too that's why mom's groups are so important so that we can corral around each other and give each other hugs and say yeah I've been there too uh, this is what I've done to help this is what we can do together um, I also think that when we're lonely, we get this profound feeling of self-centeredness in that we think that it's only us going through it. And we know this, that loneliness creates this self-centeredness, and that's what's kind of creating some divisiveness 
right now because we go to the extreme. Like this is only me that's dealing with this. I need to fix it. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with the system. We go into a lot of blame and shame. And so breaking loneliness is a really empowering tool to make sure that we are healing from infertility, pregnancy, and infant loss. So the other thing is the topic of shame. And Brene Brown says it best. She says that, what is it? Shame needs three things to grow exponentially. Silence, oh, what is it? Silence, secrecy, and judgment. And I talk about shame a lot with clients and there's so much, again, self-criticism, self-blame, What did I do wrong? What's wrong with me? How could I have done better? I know that I felt that way with the potential of the stillbirth with my first son is just beating myself up so much. And I didn't really talk about it with people. And so making sure that we, again, aren't silent, we don't keep things secret, and we are able to not judge ourselves is so important. The other thing that we need to focus on is anger because we can feel so much frustration over our circumstances. And anger is something that culturally we've tended to minimize and and say that it's not something that we should show. Whereas I believe the direct opposite. I believe that anger is something that we need to process out loud and we need to match the intensity of the anger in which we're feeling. So the processing of it needs to be on equal level with the intensity in which we're feeling the anger. So I prescribe to a lot of clients a punching bag because I find it so therapeutic for someone to just get out that anger, frustration, the resentment, the unfairness, right? With pregnancy loss and infant loss, it feels so unfair and unjust. And when we're able to no longer blame ourselves, well, that has to come out some way And so we push out that anger then, and that's okay as long as we don't push it on other people. (laughs) That's what I always tell people. But find something, find a healthy coping mechanism for your anger and really letting it out because we know that when rage resides within us, it festers and it explodes at different parts of our life or different moments during the day or week or month that may not be the most conducive for us or we're... um, then later regretting, right, our reactions that we're having in regards to our anger. So make sure that you actually process the anger because there is so much validity in feeling anger over loss and infertility. I also feel like it's important, and I feel like it is important to address and get curious about our feelings. And so when we're feel fueled with so much self-judgment and blame, criticism, being able to get curious and say, okay, where is this coming from? What is the limiting belief that I have right now? What is the story I have about myself that is placing so much blame on myself? Why do I do this to myself? And maybe going back to childhood or maybe not that far, but just being able to get curious and say, what do I say about myself? And how do I look at myself? And how do I perceive myself where I'm so quick to judge myself? Because again, shame exists by way of silence, secrecy, and judgment. And then the last thing that we obviously have to do is grieve. And grief, we know, is not linear. Uh, The stages of grief is a nice way of categorizing different chapters that we're in with our grief, but it's not like you move up this ladder and then all of a sudden you get to acceptance and you're good. First of all, there's there's a stage after acceptance and it's understanding. Um, or kind of that worldview where we're able to say, okay, what can I learn from this? But you can learn from something from grief in one moment and then go back to anger or go back to denial or go back to sadness. Um, And so you can always be in flux. And so giving yourself permission to not have a linear process of grief is really important. Actually giving yourself permission to grieve too, right? So grieving might look like I need to just go away for a weekend. Grieving might look like I need to lay in bed and watch Netflix. Grieving might look like I need to run a half marathon. Grieving might look like I need to dive in to my work and just be a workaholic. And being okay with how grief manifests itself in different ways and formats in which it shows up. 
it doesn't always look the same for every person. And we have to be open then to how it shows up for us and allowing ourselves the time and space to do that with Pregnancy and infant loss, specifically with infertility and miscarriages, because we don't talk about it, because it feels like something that has to be hidden, a lot of times then we also don't give ourselves time to grieve. And that then dismisses it and it makes you feel like, oh, you know, I shouldn't be talking about this. It happens so often that I shouldn't feel this way. I think it's empowering that there is a high percentage of miscarriages because it's telling you that there's a lot of other women that have gone through the same experience, but at the same time, we need to give credence to the fact that this is an experience that deserves attention and grief. And that if you have suffered a miscarriage, that it doesn't mean because either you're not talking about it or because it is common enough that you aren't allowing yourself to give that time and space to actually grieve. So those are kind of the ways in which we can work with the healing process. Um, as always, if you're noticing yourself having more disruptive feelings, and disruptive I mean like it's hurting your ability to kind of function throughout the day, so more severe panic attacks, um, anxiety that is just so filled with intrusive thoughts that you're unable to focus, having like scary and unusual thoughts, feeling really apathetic, hopeless, defeated, um, feeling stuck in a way that doesn't, that a coffee or a workout <laughs> doesn't get you out of feeling stuck. All of these things warrant uh, asking for more help and talking to, again, that trusted circle within you, expanding into maybe some mom's groups, talking to a therapist or someone else in the mental health profession. There are also resources, um, PSI, Postpartum Support International. It's an incredible organization that has a ton of resources on it. Reset has a free virtual weekly new mamas group um, for perinatal and postpartum mood disorders. That's every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. You can register for that on our website because what we're trying to do is create more connection. And at the end of the day, we need more connection now more than any other time. So thank you for joining me. I will see you next week. Questions or comments, always feel free to DM us at Reset Brain and Body on Instagram or Facebook. Send us an email, info at resetbrainandbody.com. Shoot me an email directly if you want, Carrie at resetbrainandbody.com. Um, know that we're here for you always. Happy Monday.